Today's podcast will be from AUA 2019. Crossfire, controversies in urology, primary bulbar stricture, DVIU is what to do. Moderator for today's event will be Jeremy Myers from the University of Utah. Debating for the issue will be Dr. Hunter Wessels and Dr. Ronaldo Gomez. And debating against will be Dr. Stephen Brandeis and Dr. Jill Buckley. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this debate about primary DVIU versus urethroplasty. These are the disclosures of our speakers. So our index case is a 22-year-old male, otherwise healthy, who developed a UTI and was seen uh, in the urgent care. His UTI was treated, but his symptoms recurred, and his primary care physicians referred him to a urologist. His complaints to his urologist were slow flow, really since he was a child, recent increasing pain with urination, frequency of urination, and significant nocturia that was preventing him from getting a good amount of rest. Uh, his uh, symptoms were very bothersome to him. The urologist did a Euroflow, and you see the typical plateaued flow over a lengthy time period, and a cystoscopy was performed, which showed this pinpoint stricture within the bulbar urethra. The urologist obtained a retrograde urethrogram and avoiding cystourethrogram, and here you see the typical short, very tight bulbar stricture at the junction of the proximal and the mid bulbar urethra an ideal candidate for either a direct vision internal urethrotomy, or DVIU, or a urethroplasty. So what do the guidelines tell us about DVIU versus urethroplasty? One, we know recurrent strictures after endoscopic management, appropriate patients should undergo urethroplasty rather than repeat DVIU. In the penile urethra, Patients should undergo urethroplasty if they're appropriate candidates rather than DVIU. And when strictures are long, they should also undergo urethroplasty rather than DVIU. But what about in this case? A limited bulbar stricture, less than two centimeters, in a patient that has not had prior endoscopic management. Here, the guidelines are vague, and this has to do with conflicting evidence that we'll explore in these talks. Our first two debaters are Dr. Ronaldo Gomez, who will discuss the uh, attributes of DVIU, and Dr. Stephen Brandis, who will discuss um, upfront urethroplasty. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Good morning, everybody. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to discuss with you this morning the uh, why DVIU is the way to go for primary treatment of uh, bulbar strictures. Uh, DVIU was uh, introduced uh, 45 years ago, and although initially the short-term results were very exciting with uh, success up to 90%, uh, long-term studies later uh, show a much more disappointed uh, overall success of only around 30%. And uh, this was uh, be because the same studies uh, demonstrate that uh, not all strictures were the same and selection of patients for DVIU was critical. And with that in mind, I want to focus you on which is uh, our index case this morning. This is a one centimeter, non-traumatic, virgin to treatment mid bulb stricture as you see here. An endoscopy is showing you that there is not much fibrosis around here. So, why DVIU in this case? Because DVIU has many advantages. This is a minimal invasive endoscopic procedure that can be performed outpatient, can be done even under local anesthesia in some cases. This is very standard technique using standard endoscopic instruments available in almost every Department of Urology, and most importantly, does, need, does not need specialized training. It has, uh, it has low morbidity, low disability, and uh, 
it is also important for the reconstructive urologist because it uh, allows for a, a precise anatomic assessment of the stricture in case of a subsequent urethroplasty be necessary. So, as you can see, it's a very convenient procedure. But what about efficacy of the DVIU? Uh, this is a study from the mid-90s in which uh, 210 patients were randomized to either dilation or DVIU. With a median follow-up of 15 months, you can see here in this Kaplan-Meier curve that uh, the results were pretty much the same with a success uh, of around 45% which is really not good. But uh, again, selection of patients is very important because uh, the best results were uh, observed in the strictures up to two centimeters. And here, success is uh, around 60%. And the same was uh, found in this other study uh, from the mid-90s also, in which uh, 234 patients with a median follow-up of 98 months, so much uh, longer follow-up, the follow-up again the overall uh, success, again, was low, 32%, but uh, the subgroup of patients uh, having a first urethrotomy for bulbar stricture up to one centimeter, the success was 71%. And this was uh, the same in this other study in which uh, 580 patients uh, uh, followed by three years, success was 55 overall, but uh, in strictures up to one centimeter, the success again was 72%. And uh, these results from the mid-90s have been replicated in more contemporary series, and this paper was published just last year, including 136 patients with a follow-up of 55 months. Uh, long and traumatic strictures were excluded, so good selection of patients. Overall success here was 57%, you can see in this curve. And uh, for the subgroup of patients uh, up to one, one to two centimeters, again, 71% success, as you see in this uh, uh, club and Meyer curve here. So in the index case scenario we are discussing this morning, efficacy of DVIU is not in the 30% range, but in 70% range, which is really not bad for a minimally invasive procedure. But what about safety? Uh, this uh, uh, probably is the largest series published in the literature with uh, 937 patients, so almost 1,000 patients. And you can see here that the complications were really low. Total complication rate was 6.6%. Uh, in general, low relevance complications, so you can say that morbidity is around 10% or less. What about cost effectiveness? This is a decision analyzed model a study uh, published in 2006, in which uh, a study was done uh, focused in one to two centimeter bulbar urethral stricture, uh, and uh, considering that uh, su success for urethroplasty would be 95%, and success of DVIU is 50%. So with this uh, consideration, the most cost-effective approach was primary DVIU. So in summary, going to our index case scenario here, uh, DVIU is a simple, safe uh, procedure with a very reasonable 70% rate, success rate and a very cost-effective option that uh, should be strongly considered as the first line treatment option for this particular patient. Steve, your turn. Good morning, honored guests and chairman. A pleasure to talk to you about the perils of urethrotomy. Dr. Gomez uh, talked to you that uh, urethrotomy is a fairly easy procedure. It does not have a lot of problems, but you can get into brisk bleeding lose visualization, and if it's such a safe procedure, why do we always use a guide wire? Look at the image at the right, how ratty and torn after urethrotomy things look. Do you really think this is gonna heal? And the technique is, is more important and subtle than you think. You have to do proper radial cuts. And this is a quality of life operation, so any severe complications like ED is clearly not acceptable. Dr. Gomez talked about that complications are rare. This is a safe procedure. But if you look at the literature, the complications can be severe. 
perineal hematoma, which su suggests that the spongiosum is uh, uh, violated, even rectal perforation up to 10% in some series, urinary continence, ED, this is a quality of life operation. Is, are these complications acceptable, for, especially for our young index patient? Strictures that are usually short and focal are usually of a traumatic etiology, and long and, and multiple are usually of inflammatory infectious. Look at our index case. This is probably an occult trauma case, uh, which can have uh, severe degrees of spongiofibrosis. So the success rate is probably much poorer than Dr. Gomez would like you to believe. Dr. Gomez quoted the, this classic article from South Africa, and you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves. But why would anyone choose a 60% success procedure when you could have 95% with a, a, a simple urethroplasty, an end-to-end, -end, and one and done? Again, the other classic article from the mid-'90s by Vito Pantador in Italy, 32% uh, success over a five-year period. Our patient is in his 20s. He needs a 60-year success. He does not need a five-year success. And if you look at the caliber, the caliber of the uh, urethra of our index case was very small. So he has at best a 34% success. So why would you choose something in a young patient that has a 34% success? It's typical that urethrotomy is, is used in the community in, in other areas of the urethra, typically in the penile urethra. And the success rates are exceedingly uh, poor, 11 to 16%. Even our bulbar urethra has a low uh, percentage, not the 70% for our index case that Dr. Gomez would like you to believe. How about etiology? Etiology is very important. As you can see in the lower half, uh, trauma urethrotomy has a 16% success. In our index case, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner, the e etiology is probably occult trauma, and the spongiofibrosis is worse than you think, so our success rate is probably poor. So we should treat this index case like a trauma case with high degrees of spongiofibrosis. This is a more contemporary series of a Kaplan-Meier curve from a series from D Detroit in the United States. Look at this, 8% success at a mean of seven months. Is seven months acceptable? Our patient's in his 20s. We want a 60-year success, not seven months. Many people mistakenly believe that you can salvage the poor rates of urethrotomy using a, a laser. But if you can see from the systematic review in the forest plots that there's no difference in terms of uh, recurrence rates and complications or in pain scores. So the, the poor results you get from urethrotomy cannot be salvaged by doing laser. How about biological modifiers? These again do not salvage the poor rates of urethrotomy. As you can see from these forest plots, uh, from a systematic uh, review, the recurrence rates are the same. The preponderance of evidence of the literature shows that prior urethrotomy increases the failure rate of ure urethroplasty. It is true that it's typically after two or more uh, urethrotomies, but why not after one? Here, as you can see, uh, again, Kaplan-Meier curves from two more recent studies from UCSF and the lower one from U2 Southwestern that urethrotomy increases the chance of failure of urethroplasty. If after two, why not after one? And Dr. Gomez talked about cost effectiveness. These are the two, two classic articles, one from EVMS and the other one from Seattle uh, in the mid-90s. And both of them say that urethroplasty cost effectiveness is when the success rates of urethrotomy are less than 35 or 40 percent. But if you look at our index case below, the success rate is probably closer to 34% after a urethrotomy. So primary urethroplasty would be the most cost-effective approach. Not only are patients in his 20s, so he needs a 60-year result, not a short-term five-year result. And lastly, this nice article from uh, Japan uh, shows, look at the images on your left. 
After your astronomy, you have increased complexity in length, and it increased the complexity in 49% of patients and statistically significant for urethronomy, stenting or repeat urethronomy to increase complexity. So this patient is a young patient. He's in his 20s. He needs a durable, efficacious uh, surgery, and he needs a primary urethroplasty, not a urethrotomy. Thank you. So we've heard from Dr. Gomez that high success rate of selected patients in uh, primary uh, DVIU and that DVIU is cost effective for this patient. Dr. Brandis showed us that DVIU, at least in some series, has plenty of complications. In addition, uh, it can be inadvertently applied to the wrong patient, and this patient may have more spongiofibrosis than what is appreciated on the retrograde urethrogram, and it can worsen the overall situation and make the eventual urethroplasty much more complex. But what about patient experience? What do patients prefer, and how is their quality of life affected by these surgeries? Dr. Hunter Wessels will talk about uh, DVIU and patient experience, and, uh, and uh, Jill Buckley, Dr. Jill Buckley, will talk about urethroplasty and uh, patient experience. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Uh, I'm not going to take Dr. Brandis's bait because he was definitely trying to goad me. Uh, the first two speakers have staked out the efficacy of DVIU and urethroplasty very clearly, and there's no argument that urethroplasty wins on efficacy alone. The trade-offs, however, require further consideration. And I'm actually not going to talk that much about patient preference. I want to talk about a couple key questions about the scalability of the results and whether that index patient really is who we're addressing nationwide when we treat strictures. So these are some of the trade-offs that we will see. And the one that I want to focus on particularly is the issue of morbidity and specialized training. It's likely that the urethroplasties and the strictures as a whole in the United States are not all those short traumatic strictures. There are a lot of short strictures that are not related to a straddle injury that caused full thickness spongiofibrosis. And we will have an older, sicker population in the next decade that de or the decades to come. Related to the decision analysis that uh, we published, the two key things here are the success rate for urethroplasty of 95% probably is not scalable to all the patients with short bulbar strictures in the United States. Uh, we don't have the manpower and they don't all require urethroplasty. And I believe that we can get better results from DVIU using disease stratification and innovation. In terms of the cost calculations that we did for decision analysis, None of them factored in complications. We assumed that every urethroplasty would be successful, and a failed urethroplasty will be much more costly to salvage than a failed DVIU. And then there are complications of urethroplasty, albeit rare, but they're going to be much more expensive than those of the DVIUs. And here's a list of complications. Some of the first ones are related to sexual function, hard to put a cost on these, but they may be very costly to the time you spend in the office going over these issues with the patient. If we are overstretching the bounds for urethroplasty and trying to align strictures that are too long, we may cause core D and other complications. And then, although a short bulbar stricture should be able to be treated in two or three hours, I'm pretty sure that somewhere in one in 500 or one in 1,000 patients, there will be a lower extremity compartment syndrome. Very rare, but very costly to disability and uh, to actual expense. And as I mentioned, I think recurrence is likely to be higher when we scale beyond the few centers of excellence that publish studies and get 85% or 95% success rates. 
Uh, Dr. Brandis actually supplied me these slides, I will acknowledge. But this is a nice slide showing on the left that there is no plateau to surgeon experience. And even Guido Barbagli keeps getting better with the more surgeries he does. And several members of the podium are in the turns group showing that there is at least a 100 case learning curve before one gets down to a less than 10% recurrence for these types of strictures. The other slide, uh, also published by Dr. Brandis last year, shows that in a health services approach using administrative data, we see success rates that are lower than what we would expect in a single surgeon series. And I don't believe that these are in any way a judgment on the surgeons. It's on the reflection of many factors, probably patient disease, patient comorbidities, and other factors. The next slide is actually uh, a way to try and think about this. This is a map uh, that we created of where urethral strictures are being treated across the country. If it's big, it means there are a lot of strictures. And if it's white, it means that there's a lot of DVIU being done. And you think of some of the big population centers. Here we are, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles. There are many more people who can do DVIUs than who can do urethroplasties. So we have to really focus on transforming DVIU. And this slide is what I think is the next step. We need to innovate to improve the success of DVIU. That would be one disease stratification that the other speakers spoke about, but also let's, let's do some science and put either growth factors, stem cells, some biomaterials, or nanotechnology to suppress fibrosis and accept, accelerate epithelialization. If you have a bad stricture like a straddle injury with severe spongiofibrosis, that may need to be removed surgically. But we could use a growth factor to accelerate epithelialization and heal the urethra. So even if it looks bad on the DVIU, it'll heal. And lastly, I'd just like to say, do we want to end up like the cardiac surgeons? This is what happened. The cardiac surgeons were ahead. And then an innovation came along, and they basically were killed by the cardiologists. And I'm pretty sure that 10 or 15 years from now, if we're not doing the balloon dilation with the growth factor and the other uh, fibrosis uh, suppressors, the radiologist or someone else will. So my perspectives are endoscopic treatment will only increase with time. We should avoid DVIUs and strictures that are likely to fail. I agree. And we shouldn't convert a curable stricture into one that requires substitution procedures. Thank you very much. Good morning. So you've heard a lot about DVIUs and both the goods and the bads, but I'm here to tell you why we should choose urethroplasty, especially in a young 22-year-old with a short stricture. So why should we do it? Just last week or a couple weeks ago, a patient came into my office in the exact same scenario, young, short stricture, in the bulbar urethra. And when I began to talk to him about his potential options, covering everything from observation to DVIU dilation or urethroplasty, he simply stopped me mid-sentence and said, why would I have a DVIU? Aren't there complications? I still have to wear a catheter for days after, and chances are I'll still need a urethroplasty. It just doesn't make sense. And I bring this up because you will see many patients just want the most definitive procedure done well and be done with the situation. So why urethroplasty? We know in the good hands that it has a very high success rate. Tried and true, the anastomotic urethroplasty, which is applicable here, has a 95% success rate. It's been proven in multiple studies multiple times. And in the last five years, there's been an emergence of this non-transecting anastomotic urethroplasty, which has equal success. A paper just published in 2019 compared these two techniques for short strictures in the bulbar urethra and showed that they both had a 95% success rate or greater. The great thing about the non-transecting is, at least in my hands, you can limit the catheter time down to nine or 10 days, and we think it may reduce some of the sexual temporary dysfunction that they have because we don't transect the bulbal spongiosum. Patients recover quicker, and they still have great results. So we're decreasing the burden of the urethroplasty, but overall, excellent results and long-lasting. 
What about side effects? We know they're minimal. Lots of papers have been published on this. There's a low infection rate and bleeding rate. There's a low or no long-term sexual side effects. Even in studies that I've done where you've compared the man's preoperative sexual function to his postoperative function, you'll find no statistical difference. So I think the risk of erectile dysfunction is low. So side effects are minimal. What does the patient want? So there's a study that came out of UCSF where they, they tried to model what would a patient go after, and they looked at a series of things. How much would the copay be? What, what success rate were they willing to tolerate? How many future procedures would they have to have? What length of catheterization was okay? And how long would it take them to recover? And when they gave them a series of modeling questions, the overlying theme was the following. Overall success of the procedure is the most important treatment attribute to the patients. So the bottom line is patients prefer the most definitive therapy. That's what the patient wants. You know, I think we underestimate the mental burden of having urethral stricture disease, the anxiety of not being able to pee, the pain associated with it, the fact that you might go into urinary retention at any time. So there was a nice study done out of the TURNS group, which looked at anxiety and depression around the urethral stricture disease, and they showed a 56% improvement or resolution of anxiety and depression, a great uh, contribution to the patients. And I have seen it in my own practice that people just rheumatic, change their opinion on and how they feel about life, they're much more outgoing. It's a real contribution. And we know without a doubt that lower urinary tract symptoms improve. Multiple papers out there, quality of life, it goes from five to six where it's terrible to terrific down to zero or one. A decrease in the IPSS by 11 points, an improvement in their post void residual, a decrease in post void dribbling, and a decrease in urgency. 37% report an improvement of, in their urgency and 74% an improvement in urge and continence. A dramatic improvement in their overall quality of life. And patients are happy. When we looked and asked patients, hey, you've had this procedure, you had this surgery, what, how did you rate it? 90% said postoperatively that they had a great experience. 83% said they would have it again. The patients are happy with urethroplasty and they would choose it again. Probably the biggest measure out there. So basically, urethroplasty, it's the gold standard. It's going to cure the problem. Why do I think it's great? It's curative. It's got minimal side effects. It's well tolerated. It improves physical and mental well-being. And patients desire the best chance for success. The patients want to be cured, and we can offer that to them. Thank you. Well, so what do we know about this uh, question now? In this short bulbar stricture, primary DVAU or primary urethroplasty, and there's, you can see, conflicting evidence. On one hand, endoscopic management is minimally invasive, it's very efficacious for the right patient, and it's scalable to a population. And in addition, in the future, there may be promise that we can bring this into the realm of success uh, that we experience with urethroplasty for the right patient. On the other hand, urethroplasty complications are rare, and it has the best evidence that it resolves quality of life issues, which are very impactful to the patient's experience. Anxiety and depression improve. There's a very high satisfaction rate among patients undergoing urethroplasty, and also, Patients prefer the most definitive management. So I want to thank my debaters, uh, Dr. Gomez, Dr. Brandis, Dr. Wessels, and Dr. Buckley. Thank you very much. Don't forget, you can register for the AUA 2020 Annual Meeting in Washington, D.C. by going to aua2020.org. Thank you.